Um, in the first place, the what is brain? What is mind? First, we have to explain that. And while we explain this, it should be very empirical in nature. It should not be something obscure explanation. And the brain and the mind paradox, this is a uh, very complicated issue. There are many people who dismiss the acceptance of the mind different from the brain. 2004, I was working with Professor Paul Ekman on His Holiness the Dilemma's book, Emotional Awareness. When I, when I was working on that book, uh, Professor Paul Ekman, he gave me one book by a Nobel laureate in search of memory and uh, I read that book and oh this is a brilliant book I would really hi highly highly recommend people to read that and in the opening passages of this book there's a mention that the mention of the current the current neuroscientist uh, point of view the hypothesis the first hypothesis is that there's no mind it's just a brain Number two hypothesis that yes, there is mind, but it is the immersion property is the derivative of the brain. When the brain dies, the mind disappears. Okay, these are the two basic hypotheses. It doesn't mean that this is the uh, position. This is the uh, what is discovered. But these are the two hypotheses of the current neuroscientists. Then the next point is to speak about the brain and mind paradox. We need to first of all know the ground. What is brain? What is mind? To explain it in very simple terms, um, what I would say is that, for example, if I ask the audience uh, to think of your best moment when you were a very young child, so vulnerable for your mother, you are the whole world, and for you, your mother is the, the, the God. But imagine you go back in time and imagine you are, your mother is cutting you when you were age three, four, so vulnerable and dependent on others. And your mother is looking at you with so much love and affection. You just imagine that. This is what everybody can do. Now, I give you to, while you are imagining that, I give you to the neuroscientist. And the neuroscientist put you, put you in the FM, uh, fMRI scan. So the neuroscientist can see your brain waves. When you're thinking of that, you do not tell what you're thinking to the neuroscientist. So the neuroscientist can see your brain waves, can see the neural firings where the neurotransmitters are transmitted from one neuron to the other, what kind of synaptic connections are there. He could see that so well, but he couldn't see what, is, what you are thinking. So, now the point is the distinction between the brain and the mind. What you are thinking, which you, in this world, you are the one who only has this experience, what are you thinking? You have the first-hand experience, what are you thinking? Nobody can deny that. Which the neuroscientists have, have, the neuroscientists have no clue. So what you are thinking, which you have a direct experience, which the neuroscientist does not have the clue, that is your mind. Which the neuroscientist can see in you, the brain waves, the synaptic connections, and then the, the neurotransmitters being transmitted from one neuron to the other, that which the neuroscientist is seeing, which you are not seeing, is your brain. This is a distinction. Then the next is the paradox. The paradox is that this mind, whether it exists as different from the brain or it exists as a, a derivative or the emergent property of the brain this is the next question this is a very serious question nowadays there is the there is the discovery of what is known as the neuroplasticity neuroplasticity many people already heard about it so there see earlier earlier the belief in the, uh, amongst the neuroscientists is that the brain affects the mind it works only one way. The brain affects the mind. Mind does not affect the brain. This is the belief. This was the belief. Now, with the advent of the, uh, the most sophisticated neuroscience, uh, the, there's two ways happening. Not only brain affecting the mind, mind also affects the brain. This is one thing. Then the, now, I personally, it is my personal journey that when I, was first, when I first joined my, the first monastery, Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, as a very young boy, age 18, 19, and then believing since birth 
believing in rebirth, believing in consciousness, believing in a mind which travels from one life to the other. With this belief, I quit physics, I quit everything and I joined the monastery. So with, the, with that belief. And then the, that same year, the first year of my uh, joining the enrollment in the monastery, there was a one lady, American lady doctor, and she gave a brilliant lecture on the brain, working through the brain. And my the principal teacher, uh, Venerable Geshe Lopsen Gyazurubashe, so he assigned me to translate, to be the translator, um, to translate this lecture um, into Tibetan, from English to Tibetan, to the monks. Because the I just came from school, so I had exposure to both languages. So I pay a lot of attention to this to make sure that I, I was able to convey the, the to the best I can to the mo convey the most to the audience to the best I can. I paid so much attention to this, and to my amazement, I was so amazed by the wonder of the workings of the brain. The language is because of this part of the brain. Emotions is because of amygdala in this part of the brain. The foundation for me to join the monastery, become a monk. Is with the belief that there is a mind which travels from one life to the other. If there is no mind, what's the point of the, you know joining the monastery? Then what happened to me? Whole oh, my existence was shaken, and then I started a new journey. I started a journey. Mentally, I told I talked to myself. Said, okay, now don't start as a Buddhist. Don't start as a Buddhist. Now take a new journey. Don't reject Buddhism. Don't don't accept Buddhism, start with a very open mind, it can be correct, it may be wrong. Then you explore. Luckily, uh, the, I, I was not in um, the ritual monastery, monastery focused on ritual. I was not in such a monastery, where I was in a monastery where the emphasis was on the study of logic. I was so, so, so fortunate. And because of which, then I undertook this journey of how, whether or not there's a mind which is different from the brain. So this is a very interesting journey. Now it's almost like uh, 30, over 30 years of journey into this to explore whether there's a mind different from the brain. Actually, I'm planning to write a whole book on this, the paradox between the brain and the mind. I'm continuously the, um, learning, reflecting, reflecting the points, but it about the neuroscience, the updates of the neuroscience, and then think more about the, the great, great Indian, of uh, the Indian Buddhist philosopher and logician Acharya Dharmakirti's text, Pramanavartika chapter 2. So trying to uh, look at, study both sides. And then I'm coming with my, the many of the reflections. One of the reflections which is so important is about the sense of the identity. I, sense of identity, see, so I identify myself as a male, and the girls will identify themselves as girls, males, females, I'm Dorji, I'm Tibetan, and so forth. This is how we, we identify. And this identity, and this is the, the center of the universe, center of the world. And so on this basis, then we operate. I need a job, I need to survive, then the, I belong to this country, then the, I want to travel, for this I need this, and this is the center of the whole, the operation of the universe, of the world. So this self, what is this self? From since childhood till now, I have this sense of self. This self is the, the same. At the same time, so this self is determined by the, the mind which I was talking about, which the scientists could not see, but you can empirically experience. This, or this somehow designed on that basis with the characteristics added from the body. So now in terms of the body, what we, what we, what we were at the time of the conception in the mother's womb, it's just one cell. One cell. And now you have trillions of cells. All these cells came from where? From the food that we get. And then when you are a very young child, say like age 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So from there, like majority of your, the body cells which constitute your body, body cells have already removed. New cells already are replaced, these cells. And the only cells left, there's some long lasting cells, neurons. 3% or 5% of the body. Otherwise, you have a totally new body. 
but sense of self is the same. Sense of self is the same. If this is totally, if this is totally the new body, and the self is designated on the basis of the body, then the sense of a new self should be coming out, coming in us. But it's not the case. So that is done by not by the body. It's done by the agent. That agent which we can empirically experience as the mind. Yet this mind requires a support. There is a body, particularly brain, as a support. So with this, then this mind will remain within you till your body dies. It will remain. And then the, as to how it gets transmitted to to the next, uh, to the next life and so forth. This is so beautifully explained by Acharya Dharmakirti, but great Indian Sin scholar Acharya Dharmakirti in his book Brahmana Vartika, Chapter Two.